Today I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about multimedia as a data source, uh, particularly about data management and support of research where multimedia is a data source and is the research material. And I guess I need to confess right up front, I'm a, not a new media expert, I'm what could be ref referred to as a digital librarian. So uh, I come at this with a very different kind of understanding, um, potentially an exploratory um, approach and I'm very interested in the kind of questions and comments or thoughts those listening in today have. What I wanted to start off today with was to I guess have a bit of a think about what multimedia is because I have to say that this is what went through my head when I was thinking about um, offering up this webinar. I also wish to acknowledge colleagues over at uh, Edith Cowan University who triggered the idea for this webinar because uh, they were interested in looking at different types of data, particularly the, the sort of data that is generated in support of performance studies and um, so that where this, this idea came from, but I really wanted to look at how multimedia was defined to get a bit of an idea about the way that it's referred to by um, different groups of people and also what it is uh, from a technical point of view. So you can see there on um, the slide, I've, I've given, given a mixture of definitions of what multimedia is and I think the second one in there is the one that really holds my attention probably the most is that it's about different types of data that's actually uh, contained in a file and um, there are different ways of referring to those components um, so I've picked some of those out in the third point. I was quite intrigued to discover that there are, are chunks and atoms and parts and uh, perhaps because I don't have a new media background, I come at this as, uh, as someone who's looking at the material nature in some ways of multimedia. I wanted to have a think about where multimedia appears in the research environment and there I've listed films as an example of multimedia um, and web pages where you can have a mixture of moving image and sound, possibly some graphics, some digitized um, documents that can have both image and annotations, markup and transcripts and also satellite images which is um, something quite new to me. Uh, we had the great benefit of a lecture um, within the Australian National Data Service recently from uh, Stuart Minchin from Geoscience Australia and um, he opened up my eyes to what a satellite image is and all the layers that actually um, exist in a satellite image. That was really interesting. Uh, he, he gave a great talk on the data cube that they've developed but that's a whole other topic. I just thought I'd pause at this point to see if any of those in the group have a background in multimedia or have some questions about the definitions of multimedia at this point. So I guess looking into where multimedia appears in the research domains uh, got me thinking about the fact that um, this topic had come up through those working with people who undertake performance studies. So I listed some of the research domains there um, where multimedia is generated to help me kind of unpick who's actually using or creating multimedia and where that's happening and um, why they're using multimedia to get a better understanding of how um, it's created and also perhaps used. So I guess I'm looking at this from a cultural production perspective and um, I started to look at the methods that researchers were using that they used to create or process data or information and I found that a very kind of iterative process. I kept bouncing across from the idea of something as information and something as data and having a bit of trouble identifying what was what uh, and I kept circling back to asking myself what is the researcher doing and I think it really helps to, to look at research methods to understand when a digital object is being treated as a piece of information and when it's being treated as a source of data and I'm sure that there could be um, quite an exhaustive conversation about this but I really thought it helped to understand the purpose to which this material is was being um, put and how it was being used and whether there was a human looking at it or whether it was a computer looking at at, at the multimedia and whether that was a useful distinction or not. Uh, and I certainly don't have all the answers and if anyone out there has some of the answers, that'd be great. Um, oh, I can see lots of chats coming through, that's really good. Um, I think you asked earlier um, for people to suggest other types of multimedia that they've been working with. 
or are aware oh, of. Great. And some that have come up include photography and video gaming and okay. opera. Where I got to with looking at multimedia was trying to understand what happens to a digital object um, and that's what I refer to something as a piece of digital material. And so I tackled annotation as an area of research, I guess, interpretation or a process in which information is applied or data is applied to data. And um, it, I became very tangled. Uh, so I picked out four areas where I could see the word annotation being used. And um, the first was genetics, uh, which was really um, interesting. I'm, I'm quite fascinated by the idea of automated annotation and how that actually operates in genetics. And it's more out of curiosity than ever having a desire to be um, someone who studies genetics. But it was really interesting to understand the capacity for generating very large amounts of automated uh, annotation. And then um, I moved into geoscience to look at what happens when people annot annotate geospatial information and the kinds of terminology that's actually used to understand what's actually happening and whether data is being applied to data or whether information is being applied to information or data is being applied to information. I really don't have the answers to this, but I um, wanted to unpick what was actually going on to get a better understanding of how multimedia um, was being used and enabling research. So I moved on to linguistics, which was again quite fascinating to discover the different types of annotations um, that are applied to, to languages. And I've listed them there, descriptive, analytic, time sequence and text. So that was, I guess, really interesting for me to understand, to pick apart, say, uh, a descriptive annotation from a time sequence annotation and try and understand what's data and information. That it, it helped kind of distinguish different annotations, but it certainly didn't help me answer the data and information kind of dilemma, what's, what's data and what's information. But I recognised that um, material was becoming, well, it seemed to be becoming increasingly multimedia in nature if it um, hadn't started off that way in the first place. So the last area I looked at was biomedicine. And um, I've got some images following this slide where, where researchers, they annotate images. Um, and they do that in different ways by drawing and adding notes and marking areas. And uh, I thought this was really fascinating. and it, made the idea of simplifying managing multimedia into what is data and what is information kind of meaningless in a way because it might be uh, a theoretical concept rather than something which actually helps the researcher to do their research. So um, I thought I'd put some examples in front of us here. And this is a biomedical slide and it's been annotated. And you can see that it's been annotated with a line shape and also with some words uh, and that there's a scanned image underneath. Okay, the next image I've got is, uh, this is this wonderful gene annotation image that I looked at and really couldn't make head nor tail of, but it made me pretty interested in understanding how um, geneticists actually manage their data um, and what information they derive from that data. Really, really complex. And the, I think I've mentioned the fact that machines actually generate these annotations made me want to understand where those annotations are actually put and how they're linked to the gene sequence. But um, I think that's a whole investigation unto itself. And the next image I've got, which is slightly more familiar for um, many people, is, is a Google Earth image, which has been, uh, it's a satellite image, which has got street markings and bubble pop-ups and line tracing. Uh, it made me want to understand a little more about how, the, how that information was being captured to know how to support researchers who want to manage their data effectively and be able to potentially make it available um, to cite it or to present it as part of their research. This is the last one, um, which I hope those of you uh, who've ever been to Portland enjoy. I found this on Flickr. And it's a, a graphic image in the background. And on top of that, it looks like there are letters that are very carefully placed in alignment with what's called a spectrogram, which is someone saying it rains a lot in Portland. And I thought this was really interesting. I wanted to understand a whole lot more about how 
these um, discrete pieces of data were actually brought together and whether you captured that all as one thing or uh, whether you capture that separately and if the researcher uses those separate components um, as part of that multimedia. But it made me understand that where the annotations um, or the combinations occur may be really critical in supporting some of the research findings. There's, there's the first question that's come up is um, someone's interested to know whether anyone um, in the in the audience has worked with magnetic tape archives or Ingrid if you've worked with tape archives or if anyone could suggest some points of contact. I haven't worked with magnetic tape archives but I'm betting that uh, National Archives maybe, um, major agencies uh, I'm intrigued to understand a little more about what's prompted that question um, in relation to multimedia um, and if there's an opportunity to, to sort of unpack that a bit more. There's, a, there's another question here. Is it accurate to perceive multimedia as not the raw source or primary data but as a visualisation of the raw primary data? Mm. You know, I really don't have the answer to that, but I do think uh, that's why I've danced around um, what's data and what's information and how that kind of fits into a discussion of multimedia because it made me want to understand um, less about the defining of that and more about what was important to the researcher to enable them to do their research. What What is the information or what is the data um, that's going to enable them to do their research? and when does data become information in the context of that research? Thanks Ingrid. Um, another question okay. that's come in. Someone would, okay. would like to know if you have any thoughts about how multimedia might work or be used in forensic linguistics? Well, I guess if you're capturing sound files um, and uh, I, I, I know that this is um, potentially been on the news of late with um, analysing the voice of um, someone who's been involved in uh, aggression overseas and uh, I guess that is, underlying that is actually looking at how a sound file is created and what you can pick out from the different sounds that are captured um, and I, I really don't know how sound files work and I'd love it if there is someone who's um, got a bit more expertise in sound to contribute but I, I imagine um, this is where those layers and being able to pick out different spectrums and potentially um, changes in modulation is really important to see if there are signatures associated with people's voices. But I think we need a linguist um, to answer that question. That's a great one. Following on from the earlier question, someone wanted to know who might be working with uh, magnetic tape archives. One of the audience members suggested uh, the ABC and oh, good. another audience member just happens to be doing a project to recover NASA magnetic tape archives to mine image, spectrogram and audio radio astronomy data. Wow, what an interesting project. Um, I'm, what I'm fascinated um, about uh, looking into multimedia also is discovering um, language that I've never used before. I didn't, I've never used the word spectrogram and it's still um, something that makes me think I'm at the doctors but I'm not sure whether that's an appropriate description or not. I thought what I'd do is introduce a, pro a project that's happening here in Australia uh, that kind of for me emphasises this idea of what's information and what's data and what are the researchers looking at and it's a project based up in Griffith but I, I think with people dotted around um, Australia. Uh, led by Mark Fanane called the Prosecution Project. It's a centre of excellence, um, uh, policing and security and uh, they're looking at criminal trials over time and um, they've been digitising archival materials and transcribing them. And um, you'll see there on the slide a nice kind of slashed image there that Mark supplied to kind of give you a view of the digitised image, which to me is information, but also on the lower part of the image is um, where the data entry occurs for transcription. 
what I've what I've found interesting um, in the exchange with Mark about this project, and I met him through an interaction with um, Alana Piper uh, recently up in um, Brisbane, is that um, that they they they're really looking uh, at making the absolute most of this digitised material, uh, looking at it from an informational point of view to look at being able to read. The, the records of these cases, uh, criminal cases here in Australia, and also looking at what the data underlying um, the information can tell them. It's been a pretty interesting uh, process to get to grips with what it is that they're doing, um, and I hope that this offers some insight uh, to perhaps why it's important to understand what the research is trying to do and that they're uh, interested in using whatever method and whatever uh, feature of multimedia to enable them to do their research. So uh, Mark has um, emphasised here in the outcomes that they're looking at a mixture of research methods, both quantitative and qualitative. He's uh, sent me an article um, and I will pop the link into these slides so that others can have a chance to, to go and have a read of it. But the qualitative uh, aspect of it was something that, that was a little more familiar to me. The quantitative aspect of it was something quite different and it made me realise that perhaps looking at mixed research methods was also a way of understanding how multimedia is um, operating as both an information source and a data source. But it's the data side of it which um, I'm finding, I guess, uh, enlightening um, is the word to use. And that they're uh, getting that data uh, through transcription, human transcription, but in other cases of digitisation it can be character recognition. So this is where um, I kind of got to as multimedia, as a data source. Um, I got, got to the point where I decided that it could be both information and data at the same time because it's the way that the researcher is using it and building whatever they uh, learn from that multimedia, whether it's being looked at as a piece of information or as a data source to do their research. And so reading the cases or reading the court records um, and also doing text analysis or data mining is enabling this researcher, this researcher or that research group to do their research, which I think is a pretty uh, incredible potential from uh, one source of digitised material. Um, and I think that's quite an exciting prospect. So from a point of view of management, it made me think about how how they were going to approach um, managing that. And um, Mark has been kind enough to give me um, a description of how the back end uh, to the prosecution project is going to work. They've got um, archival materials as digital images. Uh, they're going to transcribe those image, images into an SQL database um, and that supports them doing quantitative analysis of longitudinal and comparative patterns. This is an email that he sent um, over the last week. Uh, they're looking to extend that database by accessing or linking other data sources and he's mentioned the Trove archive and possibly um, other projects uh, or other digitised material like the police gazettes to enable qualitative, or what he's referring to as case level as, where, as well as quantitative analysis. Um, and they're looking also to enrich the data by accessing and trans transcribing the trial transcripts and other text um, archives. Uh, so I guess what I understood um, from this was that uh, my notions of splitting something into information and data were helping me to understand uh, what it is that was going to enable this research group to do their research, but also I needed to, to dig even deeper into what sits underneath this application to understand how they're storing the digitised images and how they're storing the transcriptions and where they're wanting to store the linkages between those two things. and. Um, I realised that multimedia um, in this context is very complex and that all that language that I introduced at the beginning about layers and um, components uh, is important to, I think, inform how we uh, support the management of this material. So that's where I got to with the prosecution project. So I'm just going to stop there um, before I get on to the three applications at the end. and. Um, ask if there are any questions. Let's see, there's been some further suggestions for sources, people working on 
uh, magnetic tape archives, including the Smithsonian, the National Film and Sound Archive. Last but not least, um, I decided to have a look at three applications that enable a person to manipulate multimedia. So I picked three that, that seem to be reasonably familiar to me and just wanted to have a look at how they how they enable material to be brought in and how they uh, enable information or data to be applied and what happens in these three applications and these are I guess reasonably um, ubiquitous applications, Final Cut Pro and ArcGIS and WordPress. Um, they're certainly not the very domain specific and yeah, ex I guess less uh, commonly used applications that you might find in biomedicine or uh, genetics more specifically. So I had a look at Final Cut Pro um, to just try and understand some of the language that's used to understand what's actually happening when you use Final Cut Pro and if we've got any um, competent users in the group today it would be great if you um, offered some advice but I just wanted to look at what Final Cut Pro does to digital material and from what I can understand is that it technically consists of separate files, there's something called a project file, a media source file and render or cache files and to me that gave me an understanding that the multimedia was being captured in different ways and potentially for different purposes and I have to confess I haven't ever used Final Cut Pro and I think this is uh, an interesting way for us to understand how um, multimedia is either brought into an application and where it is saved but also to try and understand what happens when you want to try and get that material out of that application and how you you store that and whether you store that as a combined object or whether they're separate objects. The Open Archives Information System uh, model which is used in the digital archiving world uh, has been interpreted different in different ways. To give you an example, a long time ago uh, when I was working on the National Digital Heritage Archive in New Zealand we decided to be very clear that we would uh, capture metadata separately to capturing the material that we were hoping to keep and I think it was the Dutch National Library decided to go a different way. They decided to build the digital object with both the metadata and also the object that was being collected uh, and to me that is two very simple ways of approaching capturing multimedia is to um, separate concerns if you like or different types of digital information or to actually build it into a bundle uh, but it made me realize that if I was trying to get material out of Final Cut Pro I would want to understand how this material could be linked back together again in case I ever wanted to work on that multimedia material again. I won't carry on with that one but I did I did look at this and wonder um, how the output of Final Cut Pro um, is captured and how the components are captured and I don't have the answer to that today. So ArcGIS, this is another tool that I haven't used but I went in to have a look at how material was uh, viewed in that application and what happened to it when it was being used and what I can understand from this is that it's possible to pull in images, geospatial images and it's possible to pull in geospatial data if you like, lat long, that kind of, that kind of data and to build up uh, layers within this application and again it made me think about being able to maintain those components separately but also to maintain the final output which may be a combination of those components could be critical to a researcher, um, it might not but um, when you're dealing with different parts of, of material, how is that used by the researcher? Uh, from a point of view of looking at a map, it's from a human point of view uh, we can read it but uh, is that an important aspect to the researcher or, or is it the annotations on the map that are more important? I can't answer that but I guess uh, in terms of being able to support researchers who use or create multimedia it's important to ask what it is that they want to do with it and whether they want to deconstruct or reconstruct from those original components. So the last one um, is WordPress and um, this is one that I suspect 
many more people have experience with. I've always wondered how people get the content out of WordPress. Uh, so I went and had a look to get an understanding of what happens if you've had a, um, a website up using the WordPress application and you want to suck all the content out so you can capture it and perhaps put it into a different application. And there may it may be very important to keep discreet uh, narrative that's in posts or, or pages or comments um, separate from categories and tags. And what I can glean, um, I think you can uh, get that out as separate pieces of data, but it made me wonder how a researcher might actually use that material, whether they would uh, just want to re-import it um, into another application or whether they actually want to um, process those tags or categories to see how much content's been given those uh, categories or tags. Hi Ingrid, there's a couple of comments and one or two questions. Firstly, there's someone at ANU using the Occam's content management system uh, that's been developed at ANU. And they use an extended Dublin Core metadata schema. Occam's can edit digital file object, such as video, audio, image, document. Uh, they can edit dig digital file object metadata and also create record metadata to which files can be linked. And the metadata itself can be embedded in the object or exported to an XML sidecar file. They're currently working on being able to publish objects and records into WordPress, including export of the metadata. Gee, that's really interesting because it sounds like um, that kind of, well, an understanding of the components seems to have, if, I'm, if I understand correctly, have really informed the way that that application has been designed so that you can maintain digital material discreetly irrespective of whether it's straightforward data or multimedia, um, and I'm using that distinction very spuriously, but it sounds like it's possible to pull everything apart and to put it back together again. So I don't know if that's a feature of multimedia that's useful for the data, research data management community to be aware of, that being a bit like Lego, perhaps, that being able to pull it apart and understand when you pull it apart, how it was constructed so you can put it back together again might be quite important depending on what it is that you want to do with that material. Gee, that's really interesting. And ah, that the content is being made available to go into WordPress. Fascinating. The question here, um, someone wanting to know if you have any thoughts on archiving websites as data sources. Is a website oh, really data? <laughs> Um, just before I get onto that and bang on, um, I guess I'm intrigued by the discussion of Occam's going from a data capture application to what can be construed of as a publication um, application and that the material becomes, I guess, uh, a means to communicate the research, but the data capture application is where all those pieces of information and data actually get um, brought together. So, sorry, to the next question on um, web archiving. A long, long time ago, um, I used to be a web archivist at the National Library of New Zealand. So, um, this has been something that's interested me for quite some time. And I've been really, I've been hoping, I guess, to see or to, to assist with enabling material to be published to the web in a way that you can have a pipeline of that content, whether it's data or information, going into an application on the web and then um, being able to harvest that website as a whole and also suck that material back out again as discrete component. Uh, while I was at the National Library um, back in New Zealand, we developed something called the Web Curator Tool, which um, was used to do that harvesting from the web. So you scoop up the website uh, as best you can from the way that it looks on the web. Um, but the example that um, I have in mind here is about how, what kind of result you get from that uh, and the, the website that I was particularly interested in was the encyclopedia uh, in New Zealand that was being put online called Te Ara and the front end of that is really important from a collecting point of view to capture because it shows you how the interface is designed and how the information is presented but the back end to that um, 
as a content management system and before that as a records management system if uh, that's still correct at the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. So capturing websites can be done in multiple ways. So you could use the Web Curator tool. Uh, it has an engine underlying it um, called Heratrix, which is uh, used by the Internet Archive. But I'm yet to see that as a workflow to support a researcher potentially capturing information using a data capture uh, device like Occam's potentially, or um, we developed one a while back called Excite 9 for um, some ling linguists here in Australia and then being able to port that into a content management system and then use that content management system to publish um, to the web. And uh, I think if there are multiple purposes to which this multimedia material is going to be put, each at each step through that it's important to understand um, what needs to be brought together and what needs to be able to be pulled apart and also what, what is it that you want to keep at the end of that. I really hope we see that eventually, that that's possible, we can actually sort of see that life cycle and ensure that that material is retained in different ways. Thanks Ingrid. There's a comment and a couple of other questions. Firstly, the comment, someone saying that extremely large file sizes could be another consideration to mention when talking about managing unprocessed multimedia project files over time. For example, in Final Cut Pro. Oh, um, whoever's just asked that or made that comment, um, you might be reading my mind. Uh, tomorrow I'm giving a talk at uh, a workshop at University of New South Wales on digitisation and data management and large images. Um, and I've been digging around um, to learn about a file format called Big TIFF. It sounds like an enormous argument, but it's it's a kind of TIFF file. And I think that that's, that's a really important point to make. Uh, and what I've learned by looking into our large image formats is areas of research that use this, like um, the example I've given is Biomed before, where they have these microscopic images that are just enormous and that they need to retain the image and also the annotations on the image and they may wish to align those annotations if they've got, they're have got they looking at particular shapes or morphology of cells perhaps. And it made me uh, realise that uh, multimedia in the way that I'd kind of understood it uh, from a, a, a library perspective was really limited and that the way that a uh, cancer researcher might look at large microscopic images as multimedia and the way that they work with that material is is quite different and that there are real constraints. Um, certain applications can't handle the file sizes so they need to be converted and compressed and also it's sometimes necessary to cut them up and tile them so that you can actually move um, those large images across a network and that really made me um, think quite hard about how you support researchers to manage their data, especially if you're you know, pulling apart um, a large scanned image. So yeah, I think that side of research is, is very new to me and it's certainly uh, challenging the way that I've understood multimedia um, to be given, I guess, my cultural heritage background. A couple of questions from the same person that are and the questions are related to each other. Firstly, we want to archive and preserve a WordPress website, our 23 research things that we've just been running for the past 30 weeks. So this person would appreciate any insights that you have into data extraction and preservation. But just oh, great. relating to this on the same track, they're also asking, should we be considering exploring export options or similar from any applications that our research IT services are considering offering to researchers? For example, Omeka Shared Self, oh, sorry, Omeka Shared Self. And uh, most importantly, if yes, how might this be done? First and foremost, um, I think th there is an export function to Word, WordPress. I haven't had a go at it, but I think it's important to um, test that out and I'd be very happy to have a, an exchange about that because 
Uh, I don't know what happens when you hit the export button and what kind of package you get and how discrete those components are or whether they're mushed up together. And I think that's quite critical um, to understand, to know how well it is that you comprise things apart and um, know about their relationships even though you are kind of prizing them apart if you want to dump them out of um, an application. But the uh, I do think it's important to think about export, import and export and what happens within the application with multimedia because it may be other data types and multimedia may be a bit of a furphy here because if it's coming in from different sources and being combined together to create an output from a data management point of view, um, you want to understand the provenance of all those components irrespective of whether it's data or information and potentially be able, want to be able to keep those apart if you particularly are value adding to something which you have uh, access to but you don't own. So for example, you have access to some data and you create your own annotations, well those are your annotations and you may, sh you may share that those annotations with um, the party that's loaned you the, the initial data, but keeping those things discrete might be just as important as being able to link them together. So I do think we need to kind of explore how material is processed, brought in and processed and uh, how we might support that coming out the other end um, so that we can enable researchers to potentially make their own data available if that's appropriate but also to maintain the data that they may wish to add to as they go through uh, and undertake different types of research. I don't know how this could all be done because it's so, so diverse. It just made me realise that perhaps putting on uh, the hat of not understanding and just trying to find out what was going on and what needed to come in, uh, what was happening and what needed to come out of that research process through an application with digital material was the starting point. Um, but in each case, I think it would have to be explored to know what to do and how much effort to apply. I do think the WordPress example was where um, I started first was to understand what would I do once I got that material out um, and how would I want to keep it and that may or may not be important to our researcher. That, uh, our colleagues over in WA um, sparked this because it sort of set me off on a bit of an exploratory process and I really hope that some of the people participating today undertake um, a bit more of that to extend our collective understanding because it, it certainly well, I have to say I found it quite intimidating. I realised that there was so much to know that it was quite overwhelming. Do you have any thoughts about 3D rendering files? A long time ago, um, I had to write um, some information on annotation, which is why I picked it for this um, presentation, to try and understand how you would locate an annotation in a three-dimensional object. It was a research project that I uh, very incidentally worked with some of the researchers on at University of Sydney looking at the likes of uh, games or virtual platforms like um, uh, Second Life to see how you would apply an annotation in that kind of 3D environment and it made me realise that I needed to understand a whole lot more about working in three dimensions X, Y and Z and where you would locate a piece of information in that and uh, what sort of tools. I don't even know the kinds of tools that generate three dimensional objects, probably CAD. Uh, tools that are used in architecture or industrial design but I certainly am not familiar with those types of tools. ArcGIS um, potentially does if it's dealing with space but uh, 3D files to me are again a whole other uh, area of multimedia that I think having um, time with those who, who work with that kind of material or having a background in say um, design, three-dimensional design would be incredibly useful because I'm very much looking at that from the point of view of an outsider. I really, I don't know and I certainly, um, I, I can't comment on rendering 3D files except perhaps that they, depending on what's in there, it could be pretty large and I, I don't know. Well, thanks Ingrid. Someone saying that JISC has been very keen on 3D works. At the New Zealand archives, how did you separate the metadata from the object? Where did the object end and the metadata begin? And how did you decide what was essential to the object 
Okay, I'll try and start at the beginning. How did you separate the metadata from the object? I think um, the cheaty answer to that is that uh, we had a collection management system which had different modules to it. So it had a module which collected um, descriptive information. So that was where metadata was captured. There was also a module that um, enabled digital objects to be loaded into it, which was its kind of uh, online catalogue. But underneath that was also what we called um, Gosh, I should, um, what we call the object management system, where the objects themselves were loaded in and linked to the metadata that was in the collection management system. So we had quite, uh, we had two separate systems, and that, to some degree, um, dictated the way that we managed that material. We managed the metadata very separately to the actual digital object itself. And uh, in other systems, that's not the case. They, they manage that material within the same application. And uh, as to where the object ended and the metadata began, um, when I started exploring Big TIFF and kind of, I, I guess, reacquainting myself with TIFF as a file format, I really, um, I guess, woke up to the fact that a TIFF file has metadata in it and data, and um, I really didn't understand enough about file formats to begin to understand um, how I would describe it. Uh, and so once I started peeling back the layer of a TIFF file, um, I realised that there was a whole lot more information in there. And when I looked at Landsat uh, images, uh, I discovered that there were layers within those um, file formats, I think they're called net CDF, that's right. They've got three layers in there, something called the data access layer, the coordinate system layer, and the scientific data type layer. And I am reading that from um, a piece of paper. But I realised that, that these were treated quite separately in the structuring of a file format. I think depending on the way um, data and information is captured, I think you could kind of move that line between um, the object and the metadata that um, perhaps describes and supports its retention. As to the last question, how did you decide what was essential to the object? When you're in the uh, collecting business, you have to make decisions about um, what it is that you think that's important to keep um, because the whole point of keeping material uh, as a collection is to enable uh, that collection to be potentially used or viewed um, in some way. And ideally you want to, to capture the essence of the object. So my comments about web archiving were just that when we were looking at what we could capture, someone um, that I worked with uh, back here in Australia, Jason um, G, said to me, you're just cutting holes in the internet. It's, you know, uh, it's, that's all you're doing. You're cutting holes. It's not the network. And um, I think he was absolutely right. Um, what we could represent was uh, a piece of the internet at a point in time. And um, I found that pretty interesting. But also some websites were really difficult to harvest using the kinds of tools that we had. We used a tool called HTTrack, um, which is open source. So is the web curator tool, by the way. Um, and you've got variable results depending on how you use the settings on those tools. And um, Flash was notoriously difficult to actually capture. So uh, in some instances, um, other collecting institutions around the world have done um, film footage of a website to actually capture it. And uh, in other instances, they've gone to the back end to, to capture what's in it and taken screenshots to reflect what the interface was like at the front. So um, I think in each case, it's important to understand what it is that's of value to the researcher and in a research context um, and also in a collecting context because uh, if you're going to go to the bother of uh, capturing information effectively, it's with a view to making that um, accessible, potentially reusable again. That's a really, really good bundle of questions in there, crikey. And will be made available by ANS online for uh, people to see who haven't been able to attend today. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, and I really hope we get to um, have a bit more discussion and input because there's plenty to learn out there. We need the collective brain at work, definitely.